The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Hello everyone. Alright, I want to introduce Jonathan Nadeau, and he's the Executive Director of Accessible Computing Foundation, and he's going to talk to us about uh, today's presentation. It's going to be about the importance of free software and accessibility. Uh, just one other announcement, uh, these are surveys. If you haven't filled them out and turned them in, uh, this is your raffle ticket. They're going to uh, draw them out. They're going to give about two-thirds of the prizes away today with this survey form. You'll have another survey form tomorrow. Turn that one in. That'll be the remainder one-third of the giveaways, okay? So, Jonathan, it's all yours. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, thank you all for uh, coming to this talk. I appreciate you coming and wanting to learn about accessibility and free software. Uh, as Eric said, my name is Jonathan Nato. I am a, I'm a father, a, a husband. I have three children. I'm also a blind GNU Linux user and an advocate of free software and accessibility, obviously. Um, some of the things that I do other than the Accessible Computing Foundation, I have a website, frostbitemedia.org, and I host uh, four podcasts currently on it where uh, one is aimed on uh, the Android platform, and it's called Droid Nation, and we discuss rooting and roaming Android phones and taking back control of your devices. Uh, another one is called Frostcast, where I interview project leaders of uh, different GNU Linux distributions and free software to get the word out about their distributions and free software projects to help encourage people to you know, maybe uh, help out the project. Uh, the next is This Week in Fedora, uh, which unfortunately I haven't done in a while, but um, again, I, I interview people within the Fedora community and we discuss things that's going on in the Fedora community, different projects they're doing within Fedora. And I also do This Week in Debian, which is obviously just like This Week in Fedora, and also unfortunately haven't done in a while, but hopefully I'll be picking those back up soon. Um, and, and as Eric also mentioned, I'm also the executive director of the Accessible Computing Foundation. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the middle and towards the end of the talk. Um, some of you may or may not know, I was not born blind. I was in a car accident at the age of 14. Uh, I could see perfectly fine up until then, and the car accident, I, I lost my sight in the car accident, and I entered into the world of accessibility. Um, before my car accident, like most of you probably, I've never, never considered accessibility and, and how people interact with day-to-day -day things that we take for granted. And when I talk to some people about accessibility, I've had a few people say that, uh, oh, I, I feel really bad. I've never even thought of you know, things like this or issues like this. And that's fine. I mean, why would you if you don't depend on accessibility? And that's why I'm here today, is to bring awareness of free software and accessibility. So for these next few moments, uh, I'd like you to uh, walk with me on this trip. And let's just um, say that um, you wake up and you can't see. Let's say you go to sleep one morning and you wake up, and now you can't see. I'm just choosing you waking up and not seeing, because obviously I have a little experience with this. I myself one day was asleep and woke up and couldn't see again. So let's uh, join me on this uh, endeavor. And so let's imagine you've fallen asleep, you've, wake, you've woken up, and you can't see. You've just joined 360 million people around the world that have a vision impairment. You're one of 360 million people now in the world that have some type of vision impairment. There's a good chance that you're in the 90% bracket of blind people throughout the world that live in developing countries. But for the sake of this discussion, let's assume you live in the United States. Now, putting aside your day-to-day -day routines and you know, discussing how would you deal with those things, let's look at the technology side of things that you do. What would you do about your technology? How are you going to check your email? How are you going to read your RSS feeds and catch up on the news for the day? How are you going to log in and, and, and chat with one of your friends online? How are you going to access your social network and talk with your friends and put up pictures of your friends and family? How will you access these things now that you can no longer see? So again, like I said, let's assume that you live in the, in the United States. 
There's a good chance, if you're living in the United States and you're vision impaired, blind or low vision, there's a good chance you're in the 70 to 80% bracket of people that are unemployed. So if you're in the United States, you're in this bracket of 70 to 80% of people that are unemployed, it looks like you're going to need assistive technology. What are you going to do now? Now, before we get too, far, too much farther into the discussion, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit of what assistive technology is. Some of you may or may not know. I'm going to run through a few free software programs and what they can do and how they can help out people uh, with disabilities, not just uh, blind and low vision. So the first one is the Orca screen reader, which is what I'm using right now. That's why I have a headphone in my ear. Uh, basically, the Orca screen reader allows me to navigate my computer. I can tab and arrow through the GNOME desktop. I can write documents and take notes. I can go online. I can send emails. I can uh, go hop in the IRC and chat to people. I can basically do everything uh, that a sighted person can do short of uh, editing a video or maybe uh, fixing up some pictures. Um, oh, and also, I, I forgot to apologize. I don't have any slides. You probably wouldn't appreciate my artistic ability. So, <laughs> um, And there's also a program called Dasher, which is a on-screen keyboard. This is good for people that have uh, low motor skills with their hands that can't really use a keyboard that well. They could use a mouse, and it gives them an on-screen keyboard with big letters, and they can e either use the mouse or like a trackball and drag it over the screen and click on the letters that way. It's a, you know, a lot more useful for someone that can't really get their hands on a keyboard and really uh, be pr uh, proficient with it. So um, the next one, this one's really interesting and intrigues me a lot. It's called Mousetrap. What this allows you to do is this is great for a person that has no control from the neck down of their body, a, a paraplegic in a wheelchair. You can plug in a common webcam, and Mousetrap will track the eye movement of the person in the wheelchair, and it will move the cursor. And you can set the timing of the cursor so when the person drags the cursor, say, over to like Firefox, when they stop their eyes and stop moving, uh, Mousetrap knows, oh, they want me to click on this, and it will open and they can navigate the computer just with the movement of their eyes. They could also use the on-screen keyboard dasher like I just spoke of. Uh, this project isn't extremely mature, but this is one of the goals of the foundation is to take um, donations from people, individuals, or, and or companies, and we are going to hire developers to improve this software, make it better, and uh, the end goal is for people that depend on assistive technology to use free software. And we'll get into the reasons of more why that's good. Um, and the last one I'll mention is one called Simon. Uh, well, actually, I have two more. The, these two are kind of the same. Simon is uh, in the KDE platform, but can also be loaded into GNOME. This allows uh, voice control. Um, you're able to manipulate the, the computer with voice control. Uh, I know it's, it's the latest KDE 4.8. I believe they have Simon installed by default, and you can actually play a chess game just by your voice. Now, again, this is a... Uh, not completely mature software, but the, the possibilities are there to extend that out so people, instead of having to even track the software with their eyes or move the, move the track around with their eyes, they can control it with their voice. Uh, the next one is Vedix. It's V-E-D-I-C-S. And this is a lot like Simon. Um, unfortunately, I think this project might not be doing much right now. Um, it was working really well under GNOME 2.x. Uh, they have, there's quite a few videos on YouTube, if you search for it, where they, they'll say, if you're familiar with GNOME, they'll say applications, and it'll pull up the applications, and they'll say Firefox, and it'll open up Firefox, and he can actually go from link to link using his voice commands. He could open up, a, uh, 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 at the time it was open office, but Libre Writer, and you know, he could dictate a document. He could open up uh, um, some music, fast forward, rewind it, stop it, skip to the next track. It was really impressive stuff, but I think unfortunately the develop on this might have slowed down quite a bit. And again, we're, we're interested in picking this project back up. Um, so, so those are some of, the, of what assistive technology can do for people and what free software can do for people. Before I get too much deeper into the importance of free software, I'd like to show you the other side of this and proprietary assistive technology to really show you why free software is important for people that depend on assistive technology. And I'll, I'll try it. I don't want to hammer on this too much, but I, I do need to make some of these points so uh, some of you understand kind of what goes on in the assistive technology world if you don't experience it yourself. Um, there's a few proprietary screen readers that work on Windows. I'm going to choose one called JAWS because that's kind of like the de facto standard. 
basically anytime someone recommends a screen reader to a blind or low vision user or uh, if they're able to get assistance to purchase um, a screen reader, pretty much it's always JAWS. So we're just going to stick with JAWS for the sake of, of this discussion. It's made by a company called Freedom Scientific, which is kind of funny because they don't give you any freedom at all. But um, so um, let's see here. Sorry, I skipped ahead of myself here. Okay, so in the beginning we discussed that you woke up, you're blind, there's a good chance you're in the 70 to 80 percent of blind people in the United States that are unemployed and you need assistive technology. This is where Freedom Scientific is interesting and comes into play because you'd figure Freedom Scientific would have done their work and realized that 70 to 80 percent of blind and low vision users are living on uh, a, a low income, like a fixed income. And so they're not getting much money. So you figured they would know their target, they would know their, their target, they would understand you know, what's going on there. They have come out with a price point of $1,200. So in order for a blind person or a low vision user, so in order for you that woke up to access your computer, you are unemployed and you need $1,200 to access your computer. I'm assuming you're using Windows here in this discussion, sorry. Um, so you need to pay $1,200 to access your computer, to, to check your email, to send your instant message, and to you know, get on your social networks. Even then, it's not 100% accessible. I mean, unfortunately, nothing is at this point. But So you need $1,200, and Freedom Scientific sells these things like gangbusters, because here's the problem. They get the government to pay for people to use JAWS. So I would have to go to the government and say, you know, can I please get uh, th this assistance? I need to, you know, use my computer. And there's some stipulations to this. You either need to be a student or you need to have a job. And so only, you know, 20 to 30 percent of blind and low vision users have a job. And most blind and low vision people are students until high school and then that's it. A lot of us don't go to higher education. Um, so there's a very big loophole there. And sometimes, you know, even if you do qualify, there might not be enough funding and, and where you are, and they are not going to be able to purchase it for you. So th this is quite the quandary here. And I'm not focusing on just price. We'll get into actual freedom. But this is, this is one of the hurdles for a blind and low vision user. Um, so let, let's say that uh, I, I, you know, I do get a copy of JAWS. I'm all, I'm all happy. Yes, I can access my computer. Everything is great. Well, th this is where proprietary software is bad, because my friend doesn't qualify for JAWS. He, he's, and I want him to be able to access his computer. I want him to be able to send emails. I want him to be able to you know, connect with people across the world over the, over the internet. And I, and I have to tell my friend, I'm sorry, I can't share this with you. This is, the license will not allow me to share this with you. And so I have to, I have to either obey the license and, and you know, hurt my friend's feelings, or I can break the license and help my friend out. So I, I have to obey the license and not share the software with him and leave him uh, in the dark, so to speak. So um, another uh, thing about the proprietary software is JAWS gives you three installs on Windows. You and I know <laughs> you install Windows probably more than three times in a year. So due to you know, viruses and other things and that, that break, once those three installs are over, you need to re-up your licenses. It's not as much as the original $1,200 but they still make you pay for it. So you'd have to either go back and, and try to get more assistance to get new licenses, or you need to find a way to come up with, it might be five or $600, I, I, I don't remember, I haven't used JAWS in like five years now. Um, but, so they, they keep you locked in, and you know, blind and low vision users are taken advantage of with this whole, this whole system. Um, Let's see. And like I said before, uh, the cost is not the main focus here. There is a, an actual GPL screen reader called uh, NVDA. And it's good that they GPL the screen reader. The bad thing is that this GPL screen reader is on top of a proprietary operating system. And to me, that is not acceptable. I mean, I, I'm glad that they're producing GPL software, but it's not really of any use if it's still running on a proprietary operating system where they're still held at the whims of the operating system that they're running under. So they can change anything at any time they want and completely break the screen reader, and then they have to go back and try and fix it. And, and then whoever's depending on this screen reader no longer has access to their computer because now the whole system is broken. So it's, it's good, but it's not uh, the ideal situation. So um, let's see. Sorry, I jumped ahead of myself here. 
So why, so why is free software you know, so important to all of this? Well, of course, the four freedoms that come with free software. And we're going to run through some of these freedoms, and you'll see why these are important and how they can affect people across the world, these four freedoms. Well, freedom, freedom two is I can help my neighbor. Just like my friend with trying to give him the copy of JAWS, I can give him a copy of GNU Linux with the Orca screen reader on it and give him a copy and he can install on his computer and he can now access his computer, access technology, be able to access the internet. He could possibly get a job because that's another thing. A lot of people don't want to hire blind and low vision users because they're told, okay, well, if you hire this individual, now you need to pay you know, $1,200, $1,500 extra for some software and then they just don't want to have to deal with that. So a lot of employers will find other reasons not to hire blind and low vision users, and uh, it's just a shame. So if they have free software, that, that barrier is now gone. There's no need for additional expense for your employee. And, um, and not only can I share it with my neighbor, but he may have 10 or 12 other blind friends, or maybe uh, he goes to a blind uh, computer user group. He can hand out these disks and give everybody access to the technology. And it's free software, and we're going to see more of these benefits. So. So freedom zero is having control over your computer and running the software as you wish. This is also another great example of free software because some of you uh, may use Compiz. Well, there's actually a magnifier in Compiz that a lot of low vision users actually use that for magnification of the screen and it works fantastic. Not that the people that created Compiz had that in mind when they did it, but it works great and it's uh, a great solution. There, are, there is basically one de facto uh, magnification software for Windows, and I want to say it's called Zoom Text, and that I believe is $900. So if they install free software, they have a free magnification that is just as comparable as a $900 piece of proprietary software. And, uh, and like I mentioned before, unlike the non-free assistive technology, you can install it as many times as you want. There's no licensing fees, and you can, like I said, hand out copies. You could have 2,000 computers in your house and install as many times as you want. And that's what's great about uh, free software and leveraging uh, accessibility on top of free software. So freedom zero isn't, uh, just isn't enough to gain complete control of your computer. You also need freedom one. You may look at the source code, study it, and modify it. This also, I'm hoping, will encourage blind and low vision users to be able to look at source code and study it, and they could hopefully either teach themselves to start programming, or the foundation is actually looking at uh, starting up programming classes for free to train blind and low vision users and any other person with a type of disability that would like to learn how to program, and this could potentially give them a job also. Um, the great thing, I, the great example I like about being able to modify the code is, some of you I'm sure have heard of Tux Paint. Well, uh, one day there was a mother that had an autistic child and he loved to use tux paint. The problem was is he was printing more than he was changing the, the drawing he was doing on the screen. So he would, he would make one little change and then print and run to the printer. And then he'd make one little change, print and run to the printer. And um, so the mother actually contacted the developer of tux paint and explained to him what was happening. She, you know, she said, my son's autistic and he's, he keeps clicking the print button every time he makes one little change, is there something you know, we could do to, to alleviate that? And what was great that the developer did is he put in uh, a, basically a flag where if you click print, it'll wait two minutes before it'll allow to print again. So that way her son will, could click print, 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 but nothing would come out until that two minute duration was over. And that's just awesome that A, you can contact the developer and he's willing to do something like that, and B, you can change the source code. The free software allows you to make this change. And then he distributed that change when he really, whenever he pushed out the new update. And so that's another great thing about assistive technology and free software. We can make changes quickly, and everyone will benefit from them, whether you might need it now or later or not at all. But someone else, I'm sure, is going to benefit from this change down the road. So freedom three I just kind of touched on is being able to distribute modified code. Uh, the example I like to use about this is I interned at the Free Software Foundation last summer and I reached out to Ruben Rodriguez who is the project leader of a GNU Linux distribution called Triskel. And he's based, uh, Triskel is based off of Ubuntu and Ubuntu 
does have an accessibility installer in it, they don't take advantage of it, and it's not easily, uh, not, it, you're not able to access it easily and actually start the accessible installer, which is kind of odd. So I reached out to Ruben and explained to him that he's using the Ubiquity installer and that it has an accessibility uh, install feature in it. And we started um, looking through the options that we had, and Ruben came up with a brilliant idea. And so basically what he did is he, when you drop in a Triskel disk, the, the latest 5.5, um, you drop the disk in and it asks for your the language, what language do you want to choose? Well, if you choose the language and a sighted person obviously is going to click on the language, it'll just go through the installer normal. You'll never even know it has an accessible installer. But if a blind person puts in the, the CD, it's going to sit at that window and he or she isn't going to click on it and it's just going to automatically start and load into a live session. When the live session comes up, the Orca screen reader is automatically running and you can click on the install button and walk through the install process. So I can install this distribution completely by myself with no sighted help at all, and it, which gives me, again, another type of complete freedom and not having to depend on somebody to help me out install Windows and help me install JAWS or, or, or whatever. So this has given uh, freedom to blind and low vision users and another type of freedom. And the effects that this can have that Ruben did with Triskel is he made the international version with the accessible installer. So we can start letting these developing countries, the 90% of blind people in these developing countries, that you can get, get access to this free software. And Triskel will run on pretty low-end hardware, which is great. So they could get this, burn a disk, or find a way to get a disk, and they could start access, accessing technology, getting on the internet, and, and coming into a world that they knew, never knew existed. They, could, they, they themselves could maybe find a job in the town that they live in. If they're, uh, they have enough energy, they could try to start their own business. They could, they could even start a service with tech support built around Triskel or built around Orca within, uh, within their like, town or, or nation that they live in. This is going to give many opportunities to people around the world just from this one change being made on the operating system. And if this one change can have such an impact, uh, it, there can be much greater impact with the foundation and the work that we're trying to do. My, my end goal at the foundation as the executive director is for anyone that has any type of disability to completely depend on free software. Because once we build the free software and there's a community built around it, more people will contribute to these projects, more people will contribute to spreading the word about the Accessible Computing Foundation and the work that we're trying to do. Our, our tagline is we want to bridge the gap between ex uh, technology and accessibility. The faster technology moves, the faster tech, uh, accessibility is left behind. And it's a sad thing, but I'm, I'm hoping with free software we can catch up with the technology that's moving. We can program quickly, we can make changes quickly, we can add stuff to what we're working on quickly. And uh, we're not just fo focusing on blind and low vision. Like I said, we want to help with Dasher. We want to help with uh, Mousetrap. Um, there's people with learning disabilities that uh, so I've heard someone tell me the other day that they'll turn on Festival, which is sort of a screen reader, but not really. Um, but they'll open up a text file and have Festival read it because they have a problem if they're just reading a, a page with words on it. But when they hear Festival reading it, as they're reading it, it helps them, you know, the information to sink into them a little bit better. So there's lots of things we can do with free software and, and uh, accessibility. And like I said, we're not just focusing on blind and low vision. It's uh, paraplegics and people in wheelchairs, um, learning disabilities, uh, dyslexia, whatever we can do to bridge the gap between technology and accessibility. That's what we want to do. We want to get free assistive technology on hardware devices. Uh, the other day on, on our way down here, we stopped at like a convenience store. And the only way to order a sandwich was to use this touch screen. And I was like, if I was by myself right now, I wouldn't even be able to order this sandwich. Now, and all it would need is just, I'm sure it has the capabilities built into it. All it would need is a uh, synthesizer. And that's another project we're working on, is building a free implementation of voice modeling where you, know, you might hear the iPhone talk or other devices talk. There's licensing fees with that. There's licensing costs with that. So the ATM and this, you know, this little thing to order your sandwich, they're not going to pay you know, 10 20 30 $50, whatever the licensing fee is. You know, they're not going to pay that more on top of whatever it costs to make the device. 
But if we make a free implementation of voice modeling, there's no reason. Everything should be able to talk. There should be no reason at that point for every device not to talk because there's no more licensing fee. There's no more extra cost on, on the vendors building these products. So we'll be able to um, get over that hurdle. And uh, so um, let's see. OK. Um, Sorry, I jumped way ahead of myself again. <laughs> and back to, back to Ruben, and this is an interesting point that, that he made, and uh, I've, I've obviously in, in talks with him a lot now. Uh, I spoke at Libre Planet, which is a, the Free Software Foundations conference, and I was talking about free software accessibility there, and Ruben got up and pointed out that the changes that he made wasn't even hard. Like, it, he, he said, once you brought it to my attention, he said, he said, I had it done in 10 minutes. He, he said, a lot of accessibility is not hard. People, like, and he, he encouraged the programmers there to take the extra 20 minutes to look through your software and to see if there's a few things you can do to make Orca be able to read the, the menus, to make Orca be able to read the buttons. He said, it's not hard. He said, a lot of problems could be fixed within 20 minutes or half an hour's of work with a lot of free software projects, if they just took the time to comb through their code and it would just become accessible. He said there's not going to be a lot of extra work for these things to become accessible. And he, he just wanted to point out that if more people would take the extra 20 minutes, 30 minutes to look at things they're doing, a lot more stuff could become accessible. And that's the, that's the goal of the foundation is to, to bring awareness and to point out these things that companies could do. Uh, one of our board members, uh, is in, ta in contact with VMware, and he's really encouraging them to make their um, virtualization software accessible. Uh, granted, it's probably be proprietary, but we're not going to be actually building any code for that. But he's putting pressure on them to make the virtualization software accessible because there are blind system administrators, and they can't access this stuff. And the more everything's going virtualized, the more these system admins are being left behind because they can't access the, the virtualization software that VMware is putting out. So that's another thing that the foundation is looking at doing is, you know, speaking with companies and pointing out, like, um, you know, it'd be great if you could make this accessible because I also forgot to mention, not only are there 360 million blind people, low vision people in the world, added on top of that, while well, including that, there are one billion people in the world with some type of disability. So if more people focused on making things accessible in some way, shape, or form, there's a billion more people that could be using their product or buying their product or using their software or whatever. There's a whole untapped market of people that can't access technology, that want to access technology, but have no way to do it. And so that's what we, again, that's what we want to do at the foundation is bridge that gap and let those billion people access the technology that's flying around them left, right, and center, and they can't enjoy any of it because it's not taken into consideration when these products are made. Um, so again, the, the foundation is uh, accessiblecomputingfoundation.org. Um, we do have uh, like memberships. If you wanted to pay $2, $10, or $20, you can become a member. When you become a member, you also get a freedommail.co email address. So. You could be uh, your initial of your first name and last name at freedommail.co when you become a member and you get that. Uh, we, we say that it's a uh, webmail that doesn't, uh, you know, we respect your privacy and no one's reading your email and sending you ads. This, you can access it through the web. There's a web, uh, you can also access through uh, IMAP and POP and all that stuff. So um, if you become a member, that's one of the benefits you get is becoming a member. And uh, you can also make uh, just a one-time donation if you'd like. Um, and so uh, the, those were some of the goals that we're doing. Really our first goal is to make the free software uh, voice modeler because I, I believe that was going to have the most impact right away. Um, if you heard Orca right now, it sounds like a robot from like the 1980s. It, you know, I, I myself don't care. It's not a hurdle to me. But there are some blind people that are using Macs or using uh, Windows. And unfortunately, you know, they license out the, the better sounding voices that practically sound human. And when they hear Orca and, and you know, Linux, they're just like, oh, man, that's, that's like taking a step back 20 years. They, they don't want to put up with that. And I equate that to um, you know, there are some people that want that nice, shiny desktop with all the bling and the effects. And there are some people that could care less. Well, you know, the, the blind individuals that want the really good sounding voice, they're the ones that want the blingy desktop with all the effects. And the voices just sound so much better. So 
if we make the free implementation of the voice modeler, then that will be one less barrier to getting more people to use, you know, more blind and low vision users using free software. Um, and so that, like I said, that's the main goal. Um, and uh, the, so those are some of the things that we're looking at in the future, working with KDE, XFCE, uh, hopefully trying to do things within Android. I reached out to Tizen and uh, asked them about their accessibility, because I'd love to get in on the ground floor with Tizen and not have to bolt on accessibility once it's fully baked. I mean, it's still being worked on. So I've reached out to them. We're in discussions with uh, them. Uh, thankfully, I, I live near Boston, and they said they're basing their accessibility off the uh, W3C standards. And uh, the office is right in Boston, so I might have to be taking a trip down there at some point and speaking with them about accessibility and seeing what we can do. Um, so I, I thank you for your interest in free software and accessibility. Uh, thank you for listening to the talk. And I can take any questions if anyone has any questions about you know, some of the goals we have, or if you have any questions about accessibility at all. I have a question Shoot. for people who are publishing content on the web. Are there keywords or some terms that make it easier for people to locate the accessible pages? Uh, you mean as far as kind of like search engine optimization? Yeah, I would say like accessibility, assistive technology maybe would be a good one. Um, accessible software, you know, something along those lines would be people would find your page. Yeah, that's, that's another goal we're trying to do at the foundation is where, with Ruben, we're trying to build a framework for distributions and software developers to show them, like, if you follow these steps, like, there's a good, there's like a 95% chance it's going to be accessible without you having to bang your head against the wall. So th there's, there's simple uh, processes that you can follow that just by default, it'll become accessible. So it won't be painstaking for developers. So we're trying to create pages like that that show developers like, you know, look, if you're in GTK, you know, in this field here, this will make the button accessible. You know, label your buttons properly so, you know, blind and low vision users will be able to see what the button's labeled as. Because sometimes it'll just say, like, icon. You know, and it's like, well, what, what's icon? You know, then you have to, like, click on it and be like, okay, that's not what I wanted. The next one says icon. And, you know, so it's just little things like that make all the difference in the world. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I actually skipped over it because I wasn't sure if anyone would be interested in it. There is a program called Exerciser. And you can run your, your program through Exerciser. And it's not 100%, but it'll give you a really good idea of what's accessible and what isn't. So it's called Exerciser, and I believe it's spelled correctly. I don't think they have a funny spelling on it. Um, so, do you have funny stories to tell about GNOME 3? <laughs> it, it, it took a hit on 3.0. You know, I was still using 2.x. 3.0, it, it sort of worked, but I mean, not really. Like, it wasn't, you could use it if you wanted to, like, if you were trying to test and, you know, file bugs, but really the average person wasn't going to use it. 3.2 was leaps and bounds way but you could, it was definitely usable at 3.2, and 3.4 is quite impressive. Um, I'm on 3.2 right now, but um, I installed Fedora 17, and I've been running through 3.4 on Fedora 17, and it's fantastic. They've worked out a lot of the uh, um, kind of, I, I don't know how to describe it because I've never seen it, but I think up near like the activities thing, there's kind of like the applets or icons up there. All that stuff is accessible now, so it's pretty much 100% 100, 100 accessible now. So they worked a lot of the bugs out quite, pretty quickly. Um, it, I guess it depends because if you use GNOME 3 in a fallback mode, which is what Triskel does and which is what I'm using right now, 
they put it in fallback mode because they don't want you to have to install proprietary uh, video drivers. When it's in fallback mode, it looks a lot like GNOME 2. Like, a blind person, you, if you didn't tell them they were in GNOME 3, they would probably just assume it's GNOME 2 because it looks just like it. But, Well, no, yeah, I mean, the, the functionality of it is all the same if it's in fallback mode. But if it's in the, if you're in the GNOME shell, it, yeah, it's definitely different. Because then you've got to start using the, the super key to pull up the launcher. And so some of the com key commands are a little bit different to navigate the desktop. But I mean, Orca and everything still runs the same. So. Was your, your experience GNOME has been bad for accessibility? So far, yes. No. Uh, I'd rather not talk about Unity, but <laughs> uh, let's just say Ubuntu wasn't too concerned about accessibility when they pulled out when they started Unity. So uh, they have a they have a little bit. I'm really looking forward to uh, Qt 5.0 because uh, they're really opening up accessibility on that release. So once Qt 5.0 comes out. I think almost by default, everything in using the Qt 5.0 libraries are going to be accessible, which is pretty exciting. So right now, there's a thing that's been developed called, there's a thing called the AT-SPI bridge. Well, what they did is they made a Qt AT-SPI bridge, which bridges the Qt framework over to the ATSPI bridge. And some stuff is accessible already just from that without uh, the 5.0 the uh, libraries coming out. So hopefully when KD 5.0 comes out, it'll be extremely accessible. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Regarding Firefox, um, how does the Firefox accessibility in Linux compare with Firefox accessibility in Windows? Uh, I haven't used Windows in five years, I couldn't tell you, but Fire, Firefox now has been the best it's ever been, in my opinion. So like on 12 or 13, whatever we're on right now, it's been great. Um, unfortunately, with web browsers, the, well, I take that back. Uh, Firefox really is the only accessible one right now. Chrome is completely inaccessible. Anything in WebKit is inaccessible. Um, except for uh, the Epiphany web browser is in WebKit. And they made a library called, uh, I think it's called WebKit GTK Plus. And that uh, makes Epiphany accessible. But other than that, there's no, other accessible browsers outside of like, like e-links or links if you're you know in the command line that works. But well, I would use e-links or, or links, but the problem is is they don't support like JavaScript. So if you're trying to log into a website, it doesn't work. So yeah, yeah. So it's a little. I mean, if you want to do something really quick and you don't need to log in anywhere, it, I mean, it flies and it, it works well. But. Um, yeah, you couldn't actually, like, if you want to, like, you know, do social networking or, like I said, anywhere we have to actually log into something, it doesn't work. So I there's an overall we take a few pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and back to the, like, accessible desktops. Uh, XFCE just released 4.10, and they had been working with Orca, and so they've done a lot of work to uh, apparently make this release extremely accessible, or I don't know if I should say extremely accessible, but... Uh, very accessible, and um, I'm running that. I haven't figured out how to exactly get it working great, but uh, I'm excited to see XFCE because Orca works really well with GTK, and XFCE obviously is in GTK. So there, I, I, I've been pushing for like a year now. Like there really shouldn't be much work to get this working, and so I got Orca to talk to XFCE. XFCE actually made a accessibility mailing list, and um, so they. they They've been working on making Orca break away from being tied into GNOME so much, and so that's what's helping it work with XFCE better. So I'm, within the next six months, once like Fedora and Ubuntu release with 4.10, because unfortunately XFCE released like a few weeks after the main distros re released their distro, so the 4.8 is still in you know Ubuntu and Fedora and stuff. So in September, October, I'm going to be excited to see how well the accessibility is working in X XFCE. Is that it? All right, thank you.
cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks.
The gym has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.